This may come as a shock to you all, but I love the hero archetype. When I say that, I don't just mean I love the current iteration of Hero, or one specific card, or even a specific instance of the deck in history. I mean I love every single aspect of them. One of my most fond memories of this game was in middle school, desperately trying to make an Elemental Hero deck work against my friend, who, at the time, was playing the meta gadgets, and I never had a chance there. But I kept trying, because there's something so appealing about these smaller pieces coming together to form larger-than-life heroes. Over the course of the almost 20 years since their inception in the TCG, wow that makes me feel old just saying it, Hero has had one of the most turbulent rises and falls in the meta of the game compared to almost every other strategy, as the deck has had meta stints in almost every era of the game in some shape or form. Today, we're going to take a deep, long, comprehensive look at the entire competitive history of Hero, and in doing so, I hope some of my love for the deck can rub off on you as well. And as such, we're going to need to go back all the way back to the beginning to truly set this stage. The Lost Millennium has just released, GOAT format as it would become known in the community is in full swing and within its most recent core set lie four normal monsters sharing the same two word title. Elemental Hero. While archetypes had been experimented with a little in the DM era between Amazonas, Gravekeepers, and the Agents, the concept itself had not fully taken hold for the game yet, with Elemental Hero and Ancient Gear specifically here pushing the concept forward into the mind of the player base. Though the four normal monsters seemed weak, there was also a singular fusion monster in the set that seemed to show the direction for these monsters. Combining their strength together, Avion and Burstinatrix could be fused into Flame Wingman, a monster that could actually deal a decent amount of damage to a player if it could land a proper battle destruction. Granted, this was nowhere near feasible in the meta of GOAT control at the time, so for the most part they were completely forgotten about until later that year, when the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX dub would premiere in the US and completely re-spark interest in the cards, as they were the cornerstone of the deck used by the main character, Jaden Yuki. That's game! So I guess I passed the test, huh Teach? Regardless of their popularity, the Elemental Heroes were in no position to do anything meta-relevant at all, even with the release of more heroes and a new fusion spell concept called Miracle Fusion, which was one of the first spells to allow the usage of the Grave for fusion summons, released alongside Dragon's Mirror, which did the same. However, Elemental Heroes weren't the only heroes to take the spotlight for long. By the release of Enemy of Justice, the Destiny Heroes would be introduced, a series of dark warriors that seemed more focused on a resource game rather than fusion summons, with most of this initial wave appearing quite bad, they were bad. However, there was one that stood out compared to the rest, being Diamond Dude, who could copy the effect of a normal spell by milling it off the top of the deck, gaining that effect without the cost the following turn. While not quite powerful enough on its own to spark innovation yet, his ability to cheat the cost requirements of power spells did hold a lot of potential moving forward, and it would be seen within the next year, as while the two hero archetypes clearly struggled to see any form of relevance, a couple of new pieces for one of them was about to change its status for the first foreseeable future. With the release of Duelist Packs Jaden 2 and Aster Phoenix in early 2007, three new cards would be injected into the meta, being Card Trooper, Destiny Draw, and Destiny Hero Malicious, and all three of these would hold significant impact for the meta of the game itself. With Draw and Malicious though, Destiny Hero would be seen far more seriously as a proper resource engine, with the two providing draw power as well as tribute fodder for your Monarch summons, but was still missing that one piece to get the last push in, reliable access to specific Destiny Destiny Heroes on command. Luckily, a card was about to release to plug that hole, but it wouldn't be a Destiny Hero. It was an Elemental Hero. Elemental Hero Stratos was an adaption of the card from the recent GX manga, being either a search for any hero on summon or able to pop back row up to the number of other hero monsters you controlled, not targeting when it did. Nicknamed the Blue Gadget in the community thanks to its similar effect with the gadget monsters, as well as the ability to search another copy of itself, Stratus would become incredibly sought after on release, despite its limited status on the April 1st ban list. However, 
though it was supposed to be limited on release, a pretty major oversight happened on its distribution. Due to being distributed through Shonen Jump magazine, they had a tendency to mail out their copies to subscribers roughly a month prior to them appearing on bookstore shelves. As such, anyone who had a Shonen Jump subscription was able to obtain their copy prior to the April 1st limiting of Stratos, and at that time, there were no card legality dates, so once he was in players' hands, all hell broke loose. And that's how Airblade was made. <laughs> Through the consistency of Stratos, a new deck known as Airblade would absolutely terrorize SJC St. Louis using all of the prior release pieces we've talked about. But thanks to Stratos, the consistency doors had been flung open. Through the usage of spells like Monster Gate and Reasoning, turboing through your deck for monsters was a simple task, which in the process would fill your grave with spells like Divine Sword Phoenix Blade. With Blade, you could banish your used copies of Stratos, Diamond Dude, Exiled Force, and Dasher to add it back to hand to use as discard fodder for your other power spells, which in the process would set up massive swing pushes from Dimension Fusion, which in turn, when it brought back Stratos in multiples, would effectively search and nuke back row in massive waves, clearing the path for the kill. This deck would take three of the top eight at St. Louis, but Stratos specifically would find its way into five out of the eight decks, being useful by itself without the Airblade shenanigans. Airblade wouldn't last though, as directly after St. Louis, Stratos was limited as he was supposed to be, but the consistency he brought did still linger in the format in the form of Diamond Dew Turbo, a deck that was effectively a more balanced version of Airblade, placing more focus on cheating the cost requirements of spells using Diamond Dude. Hero would remain in the format almost the entirety of 2007, as DDT held a significant portion of the meta until the discovery and popularity of the Troop Dupe Scoop combo, which led to the creation of Trooper Hero, a deck that aimed to rapidly mill cards using Card Trooper. So naturally, Malicious fit right in to provide the tributes necessary for the new power card of the format, Rise of the Storm Monarch. Around this time too, we'd see both the introduction of a new hero sub-archetype in the Evil Heroes, who would see no relevance for the time being, as well as a rise in another Destiny hero monster by the name of Disc Commander, who, when revived, would draw two cards, being notably great in combination with Call and Premature Burial, but could only do so much for the time being with revival options being restricted so heavily. However, a new Monarch-like boss was around the corner, and its synergies with the hero pieces was not about to be ignored. With the release of the GX Manga Volume 1 in the US, the TCG received the card Light and Darkness Dragon for the first time, a two tribute boss that negated any card that activated while it was on field, dropping its stats by 500 each time. This would immediately find its way into the Rising Perfect Circle Monarchs build that was already being utilized in the metagame with Malicious, but its inclusion would also heavily increase the usage of Disc Commander in the format due to its second effect. If for any reason Lad would die, which mind you would have already taken a lot of resources to accomplish, it would nuke your board and revive any other monster in your graveyard. So by keeping a Disc Commander in Grave, it could effectively replace a downed Lad with a Pot of Greed effect. And this would become staple for the deck as it took over the game for the next few months. By February 2008 though, a couple events had happened. For starters, Phantom Darkness would release, bringing Dad Return into the format, a deck that was known for its Tier 0 reign, which the Destiny Hero package would find a home in, and subsequently the semi-limiting of Light and Darkness Dragon and the limiting of Ryza, removing any shot Perfect Circle had of combating this new threat. Dad Return would continue to use the Destiny Hero package though, as would many decks over the coming months, as Armageddon Knight and Dark Greffer being able to dump the D heroes directly from deck proved quite synergistic to the strategy and even another hero would rise up into the meta at the same time. Elemental Hero Prisma was a Duelist Pack 10 promo that dropped in late March 2008, and its ability to reveal a fusion, dump a list of material from deck, and copy its traits was not locked exclusively to the hero fusions, allowing it to also see play in the rapidly rising Gladiator Beast with the release of Light of Destruction and Gazarus in May 2008. This is where Hero would stay for a period of time after, with pieces being slotted into other strategies for their synergies or for ancillary benefits, with one even finding its way onto the ban list with Disc Commander in September 2008. With the beginning of the 5Ds era soon after, Malicious specifically continued to linger on as a combo enabler for most dad variants. But Hero would hold almost no other relevance until another odd release in the mid-5Ds era, when a card that once again held no relation to the strategy would bring them crashing back into the limelight. It's been a year since the 5Ds era started, and at this stage, we've witnessed the rise and fall of Teladad, the mistake on the format that was Dark Strike Fighter, and at this point, Blackwings and Lightsworn have taken over the format. 
With the release of Ancient Prophecy, we received a new hero fusion in its imports for the first time in a while, being elemental hero Gaia, being unique among the fusions as it didn't require specific materials, just an elemental hero in an earth. These would be the first of what is classified as the Omni Hero Fusions, being six fusions of an elemental hero in one of the main six attributes. And though he wasn't too good at this stage, Gaia's presence would be one that hinted towards a shift in the air. Stardust Overdrive would follow just two months later, and in it we'd see an odd piece of support for the Gemini subtype, Gemini Spark, a quick play spell that could tribute a Gemini monster to pop a card and draw one. Being uniquely powerful on its own, but Gemini monsters had historically been rather lackluster, with the only noteworthy breakouts being Illblood in zombie format and Giga Plant in certain plant brews. However, a thought process occurred here. What if we had a Gemini that was raw power on its own, had some way to recur itself, and had all of the right features to synergize with some of the best generic cards in the meta? Well, then you'd have a recipe for success. Elemental Hero Neos Alias had released all the way back in Tactical Evolution alongside many other Gemini monsters, but with the release of Spark, he would come rocketing to the forefront. He had just about everything the card needed to be good. Solid stats on a level 4 body, being 1900 attack, being an elemental hero meant that it was searchable with Stratos and had a backlog of potential synergy cards. He was a light, so you could use him with Honest, the premier battle trick. And most importantly here, in the grave, due to his Gemini nature, he was considered a normal monster, meaning that the trap card Hero Blast could be used to both pop a 1900 or lower monster and return him from grave to hand. This synergy would form the deck known as Hero Beat, and while it wouldn't be meta yet, there was one more release around the corner that would change that. With the release of GX Manga Volume 4 in January 2010, we'd receive the promo Elemental Hero Absolute Zero, the water omni fusion that gains 500 attack for each other water on the field and nukes the opponent's monsters when it's removed. This would be a massive threat that was easily summonable via Miracle Fusion by utilizing a package of water monsters in a hero centralized deck. But more importantly, Absolute Zero is the only Omni Hero Fusion that doesn't require specifically Elemental Heroes, able to use any hero for it. As such, in addition to the previously mentioned Hero Beat strategy, we'd see the rise in a strategy known as Diva Hero, which aimed to use the various combo enablers like Destiny Hero Malicious and even a member of the much forgotten Evil Hero archetype, Infernal Prodigy, to enable synchro combo plays with Deep Sea Diva, who at this stage had already been mixed with various other strategies such as Frogs and Zombies, who in turn provides the water for Absolute Zero Summon. Both of these strategies would be rogue level contenders in the meta for a period after their initial debut, but more so are major strategies even now for retroplay in the ever popular Edison format, both as their standalone variants and also in a combined nature known as Diva Hero Beat, though this particular strategy was not played historically. Though these strategies were quickly drowned out by the shifting meta landscape of Frogs, Infernity, and X Saber, Hero had one more trick up its sleeve for the era, and with it, the true potential for the strategy would shine through. With the release of GX Manga Volume 6, Elemental Hero The Shining would be released, being the light Omni Fusion that gains 300 attack for each banished E Hero and recurs back two banished E Heroes when sent to grave. This specifically would be a massive boon for the spiraling hero beat, as now you had a monster you could summon with Miracle Fusion using just your alias copies. And to top it all off, it provided a way to get those same alias back to hand later. This would be immediately slotted in, and subsequently, Hero Beat would actually see a substantial growth in its top cut representation following Shining's release, with players even slotting in Snowman Eater as a Raikou like monster just to fill the water attribute for potentially summoning Absolute Zero, as well as Elemental Hero Ocean as a searchable water target. This little kick would be enough to allow the deck to see play all the way into the new era of the game with the release of Exceeds monsters, falling slowly back down into a rogue level position with the rise of decks like Tengu Plant and Dino Rabbit. However, if there's any point to make so far about Hero, it's that a single card can completely change how the deck is perceived in the metagame, and with the innovation of Exceed Summons, it was only a matter of time to see what Hero could do in this new landscape. The year is now 2012. The Zexalera has started to form some true meta threats in the form of Dino Rabbit, Windup, and Zector and Chaos Dragons, creating an identity of its own. 
In the wake of these releases, Hero would actually see a substantial amount of new support debut in these early sets. In the first set of the era, Generation Force, we saw two new sub-archetypes of Hero appear, being the Vision Heroes, adaptations of Aster's boss monsters from the GX manga, though notably were not really their own standalone archetype at this point, rather generic hero fusions that could use any materials, being Adoration, a two material fusion that could drop an opponent's attack by that of another hero's, and Trinity, a three material fusion that could boost a 5000 attack and could attack three monsters the turn it summoned, as well as the Masked Heroes, an adaptation of Jaden's unique heroes from the manga, whose spell Mask Change was effectively able to fusion summon using one monster, able to send a hero to grave to summon a same attributed masked hero from the extra deck, which while an incredible concept only had the targets of Goka and Vapor, which were, to put bluntly, awful. They also received Nova Master, the Fire Omni Fusion, who draws a card when it destroys something in battle, which was unimpactful, and probably the most impactful for the short term, A Hero Lives, a spell that could pay half your life points if you controlled no monsters to summon an e-hero from deck, which held serious potential for hero beat specifically thanks to being able to summon Stratos and being immediately able to search alias to normal summon which in turn opened the door for access to the newly introduced rank 4 pool. Lastly, Great Tornado would see its release in Legendary Collection 2 in the following months, being the Wind Omni Fusion, making it summonable with Stratos, which gave Hero Beat another tool to tinker with, but wouldn't break them out of their rogue level status. With such a focus on Exceeds, with the release of Order of Chaos in January 2012, the rank 4 pool would see an interesting addition in Blade Armor Ninja, a warrior locked rank 4 that could detach to make a ninja attack twice that turn, being intended for ninjas, obviously, but instead, decks like Hero and Six Samurai would gobble it up into their lineups. There was just one issue. Hero didn't really have the ability to swarm at this stage for Exceed Summons outside of the odd Hero Lives line, and that still required half of your life points. They needed a more unique approach to solve the Exceed Summon issue to take advantage of this new resource. Luckily for them, it seemed the answer to this was already in their card pool from a long time ago. Elemental Hero Bubble Man, one of the first hero cards released all the way back in Cybernetic Revolution in 05, has the unique ability to special summon itself from hand if you have no other cards in hand. By playing a minimal line of monsters, you could realistically set your opening hand and special summon Bubble Man to use for rank 4 exceed summons, and Hero specifically was one of the most capable of playing this way. At the time, Hero had a total of 7 spells that could either search or special summon a hero from deck, being 3 copies of E-Call, 3 a hero lives, and one of the limited Rota, meaning that they could get away with playing the bare minimum monster line being 3 Alias, 1 Stratos, and 3 Bubble Man, leaving the remaining 33 cards to be spells and traps. From this innovation, Bubble Beat was born, using many of the same strategies from the previous Hero Beat while trimming the fat of the non-hero pieces. While it might seem foolish to cut these options at first glance, Bubble Man specifically covered the major role that Ocean held for the deck, specifically in that it was a named elemental hero that was also a water for access to Absolute Zero. With the debut of the deck at YCS Toulouse that April, Bubble Beat would remain a fixture in the format for months to come, even gaining new options such as Mass Hero Acid in the Premium Collection 10 in March, Escuriato, the Dark Omni Fusion, completing the set as a manga promo in August, and most importantly, Heroic Champion Excalibur and Return of the Duelist the same month, which itself boosted the deck substantially by allowing an easy way to get high attack values and dump its materials for use with Miracle Fusion. It would remain a solid option in the meta right up through Meadowlands format, until it hit the brick wall that many decks at the time hit, Dragon Rulers. By the time of Dragon Ruler's reign ending, the deck unfortunately had just been simply outpaced, leaving it in the dust, with many strategies adapting over the next few months to include the new control tools of hat format like hands, artifacts, and trap tricks, and the blowout that was Soul Charge. With Bubble Beat left behind in the rubble, it would take a massive boon for the strategy to bring them back into the metagame, and though it wouldn't be a full resurgence, a boon was not too far off. It's now 2015 and the Arc 5 era is in full swing. Secrets of Eternity has just released, bringing Infernoids, more Cleefort pieces, and a counter to the meta for Teller Knight. With all of this, Shadal, Burning Abyss, and Cliffort continue to dominate the metagame, having completely upended what the game even is with the beginnings of modern card design. 
With that, two weeks after Secrets of Eternity would be the first structure deck of the year, and learning it was going to be themed to Hero, you know it was going to be something interesting for sure. The Hero Strike structure deck released in late January 2015, and from this, we'd receive another wave of adaptations of Jaden's unique cards from the GX manga, which very specifically meant support for the masked hero sub-archetype. The first, and only new main deck monster, was Elemental Hero Shadow Mist, who searches a change quick play spell on being special summoned and a hero upon being sent to grave, being the cornerstone of this particular release, as by special summoning her, you instantly gain access to a hero search on the following turn and to the new boss monster of Dark Law, a dark attributed masked hero that provides a blanket macrocosmos-like effect to the opponent and rips a card out of their hand if they search while he's on field. These two would completely revolutionize the hero strategy on their own, but in addition, we also got Form Change, able to tag a masked hero into another of the same level, Mask Change 2, which could mask change any monster for the cost of a discard, and Mask Charge, which recurs a hero and a change spell, all of which would hold their own relevance, with Change 2 being by far the most widely impactful, seeing play in both Shadal and Burning Abyss to access Dark Law in those strategies, which was incredibly powerful, facing down so much grave recursion in the era. Hero itself would pivot into the strategy of Masked Hero, which effectively boiled down to Dark Law Turbo, aiming to special summon Shadow Mist by any means, seeing tools like Goblinburg, Tin Goldfish, and Summoner Monk all take cracks at the combo. Unfortunately, despite its burst in popularity, Masked Hero would be relegated to the status of a rogue deck, just like its predecessors, but would see some relevance in the shifting landscape of Necros thanks to removing many of their critical pieces from the playing field by sticking a Dark Law. Regardless, despite numerous regional level tops in the era, Mass Hero wouldn't truly break into the meta here, but that isn't to say they wouldn't have any meta relevance this era. In the latter half of the era, the set Invasion Vengeance would drop, and though it didn't bring any new hero pieces, it would bring one annoyance that would redefine Hero's place in the meta at large. Well, if it isn't froggily amazing. I messed it up! Totally Awesome was an aqua-locked rank 2 that contributed itself to negate and destroy anything, then set whatever it is to your field if you desired, recurring a water when sent to grave. While this sounds like it should have absolutely nothing to do with hero, Bahamut Shark was a water-locked rank 4 that could detach to summon a rank 3 or lower water exceed, making Toad able to be cheated out onto the board with ease. Because of this, Bubble Man being a water and the previously mentioned 10 Goldfish also being a water, Masked Hero would modify its list into a new strategy known as Totally Hero, a deck whose primary game plan involved utilizing 10 Goldfish to trigger the Shadow Mist search to access Dark Claw, then utilizing it with Bubble Man to access Bahamut and Toad. While it seems clunky, which it absolutely was, a board of Toad and Dark Law was shockingly competent and difficult to play into for the era, leading the deck to be an incredibly popular choice for the time seeing its first tops at YCS Anaheim 2016 and being a staple fixture of the format at Tier 2 to Tier 3. In that time frame, Hero as an archetype had a bit of a resurgence in support as well, between the New Age Destiny heroes from Aster's appearance in Arc 5, Honest Neos and Dula Saga providing an in-archetype battle trick, and even the first main deck Vision Hero, being Vision Hero Vion a monster who, on summon, dumps a hero from deck to grave and can banish a hero in grave to search for polymerization, which while not too useful yet would grow in its utility in the coming years. With that said, eventually the good times came to an end, and with the release of Raging Tempest in May 2017, Zodiac would descend upon the format and cull the weaker decks to form one of the most dominant tier 0 landscapes in the game's history, leaving no room for hero to adapt. With the Master Rule 4 update soon after, Hero would be completely forgotten in the game, needing a lot more attention to do anything even remotely relevant. With the changes under Master Rule 4, Hero suffered massively in the rise of Link summoning. While Hero would see multiple support waves, such as Destiny Hero Dangerous in the Code of the Duelist, Elemental Hero Solid Soldier in the 2015 Megatons, the first Hero Links in Wonder Driver and Dread Decimator in Legendary Hero decks, and Cross Crusader and even a fusion from deck spell for Destiny heroes called Fusion Destiny in Dark Neo Storm, Hero couldn't shake its primary issue for the time period. It had no ability to both set up a Link monster to provide zones and do its play lines. This issue would be solved with the release of Battles of Legend Heroes Revenge in July 2019, with the adaptation of the remainder of Aster's vision heroes from the manga, specifically in Ferris, who could discard a hero to summon itself and set a vision hero in the spell trap zone as a continuous trap and Increase, who can, as a continuous trap, tribute a hero to summon itself, then special summon a level 4 lower vision hero from deck. 
These two would be able to access Vion, who in turn dumps the hero in search's polymerization, as well as provide link material for one of the extra heroes, all without using your normal summon, which while providing a leg for heroes to stand on in the meta would still leave the strategy as, at most, a random pick for the regional level, beginning their identity as a balls-to-the-wall combo deck. This would only grow in the coming months with releases like Evil Hero A Dusted Gold and Malicious Bane, who themselves formed a self-contained package that could tack on a boss to the end of any hero combo provided you have the zone for it. Elemental Hero Sunrise and Liquid Soldier, who provided more combo potential for strategy by providing board swarming, draw power, and a search for miracle fusion, while also providing spot removal via Sunrise's effect, and Infernal Divisor, which could search specifically listed materials on hero fusions, which was easily the weakest of the extra heroes, but still held combo potential. The streak of mediocrity was soon to end though, as with the removal of the extra monster zone restriction on fusions, heroes were bound to make some kind of a comeback eventually, it would just need that one piece. Little did they know that piece would do a little more than help hero, it would help literally everything. With the Vrain's era coming and going with Hero's relevance about as low as it's ever been in the game's history, things started to pick up a little with the pivot back to the previous rules for fusion monsters. Though Hero was still far weaker than almost everything else in the meta and remained near the bottom of rogue play, it did continue to see smatterings of tops at the regional level through Virtual World, Dragon Link, and Trizu formats. Something was about to shift in that mindset though with the release of the last core set of 2021, and seeing as it was even named after the Destiny heroes, it was bound to have something. Burst of Destiny dropped in November 2021, and initially was cracked open thanks to the meta archetype of Sword Soul being front and center. Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer was a fusion of a level 6 or higher hero and any Destiny Hero monster, able to pop a card you control and any other card on field once per turn, reviving a Destiny Hero in the standby phase of the next turn after it's destroyed. While this obviously would be good for Hero, the talk was around its usage in replacing a then-niche tech option for decks named Red Eyes Dark Dragoon, which was makeable thanks to the Link Predaplant Verte Anaconda being able to send Red Eyes Fusion from deck to grave to copy the effect, providing a 2 pop and Omni Negate body at the end of a combo line at the cost of 3 bricks in the deck. DPE instead showed an interesting trade off, in that while its effect was weaker in the short term, it was infinitely reusable thanks to its revive, the bricks you play could actually turn out to be useful once put in the grave, and its spell, Fusion Destiny, didn't lock you until you actually activated it so unlike Red Eyes Fusion, it wasn't dead if you drew it. These factors all played a part in effectively retiring Dark Dragoon from the format outside of niche applications and decks like Virtual World. And with Sword Soul using it as a pseudo backup plan, DPE's popularity grew fast, seeing Dasher and Celestial also grow in usage due to being the best targets for DPE summon, with Dasher potentially providing a free summon the next turn, and Celestial being able to convert both into a draw too. Over the following months, the meta would morph into a more combo pile-centric meta with the release of the Adventure Package, and as such, a generic boss that can be accessed with any two effect monsters grew massively popular, with the DPE Package seeing play in just about every deck in the meta, even with Fusion Destiny going to two soon after, as Verte didn't care how many copies you played. This would come to a head in May of 2022, when Verte Anaconda would eat a ban on the ban list update, completely killing the DPE engine in most decks, once again relegating the card to hero decks for a period. As for those hero decks though, they did receive one other card back in Burst of Destiny, being Destiny Hero Denier, which could stack a Destiny hero from deck, grave, or banished on top of the deck when summoned once per turn, and can summon itself from grave if you have Destiny heroes either on field or in grave once per duel, being effectively a way to recycle your copies of Malicious back into the deck once banished, which did a number of things for the rogue level hero deck, as with now DPE and Denier, you had a boss worth summoning on the first turn reliably aside from Dark Law, who wasn't nearly as reliable to summon. This wouldn't be the last support for Hero, as we'd also receive a couple of more waves, some larger in scope than others. The first was in Power of the Elements in August of 2022, being a wave of Neo support that aimed to get to the new boss of Shining Neos Wingman, a fusion of Neos and a Wingman fusion that pops cards on field on summon up to the number of attributes of heroes you control. 
can't be destroyed by card effects, gains 300 for each hero in grave, and burns the opponent for the attack of any monster it destroys in battle. Which, while notably powerful, was next to unplayable due to requiring effectively the original Flame Wingman, which itself was completely unplayable. Maze of Memories in March 2023 would bring another singular card in Wake Up Your Elemental Hero, a fusion of an Elemental Hero fusion and one or more warriors. Gaining 300 for each material used, can attack up to the number of fusion monsters used to summon it, destroys anything it battles, and burns for that monster's attack, and if destroyed, summons a warrior from deck. While this looks like just another situational OTK pusher for the strategy, Wake Up actually solved a couple of major issues at the time. The ability to play into Nibiru better and reliable access to Dark Law. It was an open secret for the longest time that the easiest way to beat a hero player was to simply hold Nibiru until the end of their combo. But with Wake Up's release, that became false, as if you did, the hero player could then still combo off as the final piece of their line could be performed in the end phase. Through a number of combos, you could build up a board of both Wake Up and DPE, who could pop both itself and Wake Up in the end phase, triggering Wake Up's summon effect and his own revive effect, with Wake Up summoning Shadow Mist, who would then search Mass Change, which could be activated immediately to access Dark Claw. Once again, this would not boost them out of the rogue range, but it was notable as an extreme power boost for the strategy, similar to their most recent card at the time of writing this, being Elemental Hero Flame Wingman Infernal Rage, from Battles of Legend Monstrous Revenge in June 2023. Infernal Rage could, on summon, search a favorite card from deck, and could, if summoned using a normal monster, tribute itself to summon an Elemental Hero Fusion from the extra deck. While it seems like just another piece to weave into combos, it actually did one thing major to boost heroes a ton. It was a good wingman fusion. By searching for favorite contact with this summon, Infernal Rage could be fused with Neos now on the opponent's turn to make Shining Neos wingman as a piece of interruption, which would be seen at the national level with a top 32 finish at the NAWCQ in 2023, though would still be considered a rogue option, being currently the last premier top of hero. Which brings us to today. As of the writing of this video, there are currently no planned ways of support for the various hero sub archetypes but realistically, there's bound to be something in the coming year. If there's one thing I know, it is that until Yu-Gi-Oh! as a game ceases to exist, there are some strategies that will just continue to get more and more support, being that of Dark Magician, Blue Eyes, and Hero, as they really are the most popular monster series in the game's history off the back of nostalgia alone. Hopefully with the next wave, we can see Hero reclaim the spotlight they once held so proudly. But I'm not holding my breath. Editor's note, Malicious is at three! A huge shout out to my Dark Law level patrons, Dammit Marco, Jukes, NTBYGO, Otaku GamerX, Prinrin, Ryza339, and Takamine Fujiwara, as well as all of my other patrons over on Patreon.com. If you'd like to support the channel, consider following me on Patreon, where support tiers start at as little as $1 and you get access to all my videos a day early. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel, that way you don't miss out on any future videos. Every subscription helps out more than you think. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next time.